Good morning, everyone. This is your host, Nandini Kashyap, and I'm welcoming you all on behalf of CHI. Welcome to BioIT Virtual Conference. All our speakers and our chairperson are here. And today's session is becoming a data-driven organization. Our panel moderator is Tanya Kesaroli. She is the CEO of TCB Analytics. Everybody, please say welcome to Tanya and our speakers by saying hello in the chat box. Take it away, Tanya. Great, thank you. Uh, so first, just thank you for having us uh, for this panel. I think this is gonna be a pretty awesome, uh, exciting conversation. We have a really interesting panel, uh, diverse mix of backgrounds here. One thing that you'll notice is we have a lot of people that have come either from academia, transition to industry, but they've kind of worked all across um, the board in their various companies, whether it's startups or large companies, um, going from being just full-time hands-on practitioner to growing data science teams, managing teams, um, and working straight up, you know, to the to the C level. So I just think these these panelists have a really interesting perspective, and um, being practitioners themselves, I think you're going to get a very interesting uh, insight into you know how how they function in their data science positions. Um, quickly, going to go through and introduce each panelist. So. Everyone can see my screen where Helena is running late. Hopefully she's going to join us. Um, yeah. Oh, here she is. Hi, Helena. <laughs> so Helena Davis is a data scientist and she's passionate about innovating, automating and accelerating processes in healthcare and the life sciences industry. Uh, she works with business partners, domain experts and technology teams in order to identify and implement biomedical and semantic solutions that lead to better decision making and targeted research. She started her career as a PhD student in computational biology at MD Anderson Cancer Center, worked as senior scientist at Foundation Medicine, which I think Lauren also worked at, led a team of data scientists at Elsevier, and is currently working as a manager for the consulting firm ZS Associates. Welcome, Helena. Next, we have Adam Jenkins. He's an associate director of global data science at Biogen, where he works on optimizing commercial outcomes through marketing, patient outreach, and field force in infrastructure utilizing data science and predictive analytics. Prior to being commercial lead, Adam was part of their digital health team where he worked on next generation application of wearable and neurological tests, which sounds like you and Heather Shapiro should talk. Uh, holding a PhD in genomics, he also teaches management skills for data science and big data initiatives at Boston College. Heather Shapiro comes from an academic background in cognitive neuroscience, where she studied neural mechanisms implicated in developmental disorders. She left the academic world to join Pebble, the first ever smartwatch company, where she worked on the development of Pebble Health. Currently, Heather is the head of data science at Pair Therapeutics, a company building the world's first uh, FDA-cleared digital prescription therapies. And Lauren Young is a senior scientist at Beam Therapeutics, where she uses her deep expertise in next-gen sequencing data analysis to assess off-target activity of genome editors. She's developed and managed a wide range of bioinformatics pipelines, including tumor-specific neoantigen prediction, whole exome sequencing, and single-cell gene expression profiling, as well as informatics-related GMP quality systems. Before Gritstone, Lauren spent four years at Foundation Medicine where she developed algorithms to enable genomic profiling of circulating tumor DNA and gene fusions in RNA-seq data. She played an active role in experimental design and assay validation, helping to develop the tumor profiling assay into a viable diagnostic product. So welcome all our panelists. Um, I'm excited to kick things off here and let's just I'll keep this um, slide up. So we encourage us to be you know, an interactive uh, discussion. We have some really interesting questions lined up but we're hoping to also get some audience questions. Um, so don't be shy and let's kick things off. Um, we're just gonna go right in order with this one. So what is the one thing that you wish everyone knew about data science? Heather, we'll start with you. All right, sounds good. So I wish that people knew that it wasn't just a, a singular thing. Um, Data science is an extremely diverse, highly varied function, and it can mean a lot of different things at different companies, depending on what the need and the application is. And so it's really important to understand specifically what a data, fun data science function is doing, um, what their application is, what their technical methods are, in order to understand um, what might 
results in success for data scientists. Great. And sorry, I'm having my screen is going crazy here. Trying to get my video back. Uh, Adam, let's go to you. Um, the one thing I wish most people knew was that it, it wasn't necessarily a, uh, a sexy career, as people say. Um, there's a lot of time that's spent in the, uh, in the weeds and a lot of times, you know, cursing the uh, decision to be a data scientist. Um, so, you know, it's one of those things where a lot of people see the end product and think that it was kind of a, a glorious journey to get there. Um, and a lot of times it's, you know, in the weeds and the nitty gritty, you know, looking at CSV files and things like that when it's not actually, um, you know, all fun and games the entire time. Right. Like I think I saw the, the PPP loan data was released and Philadelphia was spelled eight different ways. <laughs> so that was something that data scientists have to clean up. Um, okay. Uh, Lauren. Okay. So I feel like often in the life sciences world, particularly at small startups, everything is high priority. So I wish that everyone could understand that data science is not this like auto magical function within a company. And just like wet lab science, data science tools take time and testing to develop into robust and accurate solutions to a problem. So, you know, having hot off the press experimental data, especially from the first go at a brand new assay, doesn't mean your data is going to be ready in 30 minutes. And so that's sort of one, one major thing that I experienced quite a bit um, that, that I wish, wish everybody else knew. Yeah, I, I can't tell you how many times I've, in certain, I think certain industries or companies especially, um, hey, have this model on my desk tomorrow. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, do you see what there's done? Can you have this ready for a meeting tomorrow? By the way, I'm not entirely sure what I put on the sequencer. <laughs> exactly. Um, Helena, what's the one thing you wish everyone knew about data science? Uh, generally the same feeling. It's not a silver bullet. For every machine learning model that you want, you need to hire at least two or three data wrangling people to do the data cleaning and the debiasing, et cetera. All right. And, and do you feel like, do you think a lot of, you know, most companies um, tend to value those positions or put budget towards, you know, the data wrangling, the QC? Um, or do they kind of expect the data scientists to do all that? The latter. I, I get the sense that most companies that are trying to get into the game of data science and leveraging their data as an as asset um, don't fully appreciate the role that data governance, data wrangling, data engineering plays in making companies that want to sell data assets successful. So that actually leads me into an interesting question. How, how does one help sell the idea internally of data governance, how important it is, um, you know, just stressing the fact that, you know, you may see the end product, but if the end product is wrong, that, that's problematic. And, and at the end of the day, really, it comes down to the accuracy and quality of our data. Anyone can take that. That's a big, that's a big challenge, but I would say being extremely explicit about what our the risks for what can happen if we're under investing in those areas is really important. And also playing out a few different scenarios, like maybe you don't have the funds to in, invest in whole headcounts to support some of those areas, but then what does it mean in terms of um, the timelines for what a data scientist can accomplish if they are also um, supporting all those areas? Yeah, I agree with Heather. Um, one thing that we normally do is um, discuss the ramifications if we don't do it from a, from the get go. Um, you know, it can be everything from, you know, if things aren't auditable, these are the risks that we run. If things aren't um, prepared for the downstream analyses, here's the timelines, here's the cost incurred by it. So really putting it into perspective, not to be all doom and gloom, but really to say, you know, here's what we are battling if we don't do it a certain way. Um, that's how we usually frame it. Um, and, you know, when you're, when you're working from the bottom up, that's usually uh, what works the best for me. Got it. Yeah. And, and I think it's, it's important, um, you all mentioned, you know, talk about the risks, but not in a doom and gloom way. So if we're able to kind of quantify those risks, hopefully that helps. Um, 
you know, the leadership and the senior leadership understand. So uh, we're going to go on to the next question. I haven't seen any come in so far, but um, oh, hold on. We have a comment. Data governance, I like to say, be a data scientist, not a data janitor, right? And uh, I think we all know, you know, data janitor is probably sometimes 80% of the job. So um, there's a lot of responsibility. Uh, next question, what are some obstacles you've had to face when building out a data team and culture and how did you resolve them? So anyone take that? I can go first on that one. Um, I, as I'm not, I don't actually consider myself a data scientist. I kind of sit before data science can happen and I am responsible for pipeline development and doing some of the data governance that we were just talking about. And so as, as a wet lab scientist turned bioinformatics scientist, I'm in a really unique world where I sit between the labs that are generating the data, often at very high throughput, and the software engineers and cloud engineers who are productionizing pipelines, um, and then ultimately the data scientists who are relying on the, a, a quality set of infrastructure that's been built to do their job. And so these are all very unique roles, which which can overlap, they can have some blurriness to them, but, but they're all, they all require unique expertise. So one of the biggest challenges I've faced out of all of the startups I've worked at, um, especially where computational teams are in the hierarchy under R&D science, is that it's often not recognized that to build a robust production scale analysis pipeline with database infrastructure to store and query results takes all of this expertise. Um, and it can be challenging in the early days to get buy-in from senior management to hire for all those roles. Um, also often senior management thinks that one computational scientist can do all of this for a very large and often continuously growing team of wet lab scientists, which can lead culturally to a computational team feeling constantly behind, feeling overwhelmed, feeling like, oh, I can't keep up, I can't keep up. And so to do that, or to overcome those things, I think it's really important to be very transparent about ongoing and upcoming activities, discussions like we just talked about where you just are, again, very transparent about what is involved to make sure we end up with a good quality answer and what is a realistic timeline given everything going on. And often it's important to take a member of, of every team affected by a project or involved in a project and say, you know, here's everything that's going on. You guys decide what's most important now and what can wait till later until you, until you want to give us more manpower or person power. I like that approach. I could have probably used that a couple of times. Anyone else? Uh, what, how, what challenges have you faced when building out a data team and culture? Anything similar to Lauren's experience? So in my experience, it would, it would fall on a thread that Adam first started when he said he wishes uh, people knew data science wasn't as sexy as it sounds. Um, and to the point that uh, you made, Tanya, around uh, janitorial work being a big part of the job. Um, some obstacles I face is managing expectations around what a data scientist wants to do versus what they, they need to do. They want to be building really exciting models. And oftentimes, um, a lot of what we're doing is not as exciting as that. And there's a lot of the foundational work. And so um, that can be a challenge, especially in my experience, I come from small, smaller companies um, where we tend to be generalists more of the time because we don't yet have the resources to hire out for a lot of the different supporting roles. Um, and so I think it is always a challenge, something that I've found to help a little bit is the more you can provide individuals with ownership over their projects end to end, then they can really see and own that. In addition to doing something really exciting, there are a number of other steps that they need to do to get there. Great. In my experience, um, especially in, in the modern world where, you know, if you want uh, an algorithm that just does sequence analysis, you can download something from the web, or you want an algorithm that classifies images, you can download a notebook from the web. And, you know, whereas that's convenient and that's exciting, it's also extremely dangerous because what I, you know, I do come across very often uh, team members who just, you know, downloaded something from the web. They don't understand how it works. 
they don't understand that you know machine learning wants to be right so if you give it an unbiased uh, an uh, unbalanced data set it's going to try to match your distribution it's not going to learn anything i mean the, the libraries make our lives as data scientists much easier but they make our lives as leaders much harder because then it's on us to actually make sure that the team understands what gradient descent is and the team understands that if you have too many parameters in your model then your model is going to memorize the data <laughs> there's so many little intricacies that that these libraries hide um and and that makes it for uh, you know being able to to actually coach the team in, in thinking about little nitty gritty details they don't want to think about. It's for me, one of the hardest challenges. Yeah, that's, go ahead, Adam. I was gonna say, for me, what I find really, really difficult is um, not having the question fully vetted before kind of embarking upon what you're actually trying to do. And I think it's, it's really hard, when you, especially when you're in a uh, kind of an adolescent stage of building out a team where you have pressure coming from, you know, other external sources in your team saying that we need X, Y, and Z done. Um, you know that they don't understand exactly what's going on, what it'll take. Uh, you know, the questions aren't fully vetted. So you might think that, hey, it's just a model that needs to be built. But the actual question is, how do we get the pipeline together? How do we make this, you know, a, in a usable format, things like that. So I think that having that question fully vetted and fully understood by all the stakeholders is, is usually the hardest part. And, you know, once you know what the real question is, then, you know, hiring and building a team to solve that's a little bit easier. Um, but without that, you start, you know, things start falling apart relatively quickly, you know, and that's when you start seeing people leaving teams and things like that, because it's not exactly what they thought kind of the position was going to be. Great. I think this actually segues us into another interesting conversation. Um, so, you all have really interesting backgrounds, right? A lot of you have come from academia and transitioned in the industry. Um, you've been hands-on with data and coding. You, might, you probably still are. Um, you're managing people. You're contributing to, you know, organ organizational data strategy at a senior level. Um, so you're, you're doing it all, right? Um, given, given those unique perspectives, how can companies uh, better foster this collaboration and, and have their data teams that you're working so hard to build be more effective? I think it's super important to make sure data science is embedded at the initiative level and that we're, as we grow as a function, we're not kind of off to the side as a, a service organization. We are organizationally, I think it, we are, um, a cohesive team, but making sure that every member is really embedded on cross-functional projects. It helps um, with the other teams better understanding what we do, um, how we can all drive towards a common goal, and also it helps enable others across the company to more innately understand how we add value, which then helps for when you're vying for more resources to build the team or, or build out associated functions to support data science. So embedded data teams, uh, Lena, it looks like you're going to say something. Yeah, I mean, embedding data teams is critical, but it's also critical to make sure that the team itself is cohesive, um, especially when you're putting together teams that include data scientists and domain experts and engineers and testers. And one of the things I found is, is really powerful is to foster, to, to encourage team mem members to foster curiosity and interest about what everybody's doing and what everybody's talking about. Because what I, what I notice is people do have this tendency of staying in their domain. So when the data scientist starts listening to the biologist speak, they turn off, right? They seem, often they just assume, oh, this is not my domain, I don't have to pay attention to. And I, 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 I one of the most powerful things I found is helpful in building this cohesive team is encourage them to actually be curious about what the biologists are talking about, right? Um, that will create a much more cohesive, much more passionate, curious team um, that, that ends up being much more effective at the end of the day. To echo Elena, I think that is a really, or Helena, I really think that's a really, really important factor, particularly in the early stages of 
of data science or pipeline development at a company where, um, you know, sometimes also, you know, people, wet lab scientists organizing projects, particularly if they've come from academia where they're used to kind of being in control and complete control of every little thing are hesitant to reach out for help. And they don't even know you have the ability to help them. And so I, you know, every, well, back in the days when we were allowed in the office, I would, um, <laughs> I would I would walk around the office once or twice a day and and even I'd walk into the lab and be like, hey, what are you guys working on? Is there anything I can do to to help make your life easier to, you know, help early on get this project moving toward if it becomes something you want productionized, we're prepared for it. And really having, you know, at least somebody who's outgoing enough on the team to almost force the issue, but do it in a way that makes people feel comfortable. You don't want to do it in a way that's like, I want to take your project. It's like, I want to support you and I want to help make this the highest quality thing it can be for the organization and for the science we're trying to do. And so I think it takes a little bit of upfront um, in the hiring process to, to kind of recognize that people have that curious personality that you were talking about, Helene, that um, where they will kind of on their own sort of go, hey, what are you guys working on? I'm curious to learn. Teach me. Stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah, and I think that that's huge. Go ahead, Adam. And I was going to say that I think that kind of goes to the culture of, you know, the type of people that you hire. Um, you know, what I see a lot of times in, in, and I definitely experienced this early in my career is a lot of times people are uh, urgent to hire kind of the, the, the best, most advanced, you know, data scientists that you can is like your first hire for things. And a lot of times it's not actually what you need. You know, you need a generalist, you need someone who will ask the questions, who doesn't think that they know everything. Um, so, you know, being very, very cognizant of, of, of the people that you have in your group and kind of what dynamics that'll instill both early on than later on with projects, I think is, is paramount and usually something that people, a lot of people uh, overlook um, as being uh, an important thing that they should worry about. Yeah, I think these are all good points, uh, especially the just talking to each other. Uh, I've literally been to companies where um, the the data scientists are like these mystical creatures locked away in a back room. <laughs> no one knew what they did. Um, as you can probably guess, they weren't getting very far working with the team. Um, I, we actually have a question from the audience that we'll take now from, it's he says, uh, where do people draw the line at meeting scientists and leadership where they are in terms of visuals and platforms versus pushing for change in education. If someone asks for a pie chart, for example, I push back, but not everything is so clear cut. I think the pushback is, is a good thing to do. Um, and again, I would bring, bring the conversation back to curiosity. Ask why, you know, what, what's your intent with this pie chart? What, you know, what message are you trying to convey? What story are you trying to tell, right? And, and most people would be happy to, to share that with you. Yeah, I would, I would echo that. I think it's one, you know, it, it's usually the pick your battles uh, strategically type of thing. Um, you know, if someone's just asking for a visual and, you'll, and you know it's not a big deal, just, you know, usually do it. But I think it goes back to understanding where everyone understands what the problem is and what kind of the business context is. Um, because a lot of us are doing things for businesses. It's not, it's, you know, there is a reason why we're doing things. And it, sadly, for a lot of us, it is, you know, to, to make money or create a product or something of that sense. And I think that a lot of us sometimes lose sight of that. Um, so, you know, understanding the business context and what, we're tr what they're trying to get out of those type of things um, is usually pretty important. Um, you know, for instance, I'm someone who hates... Uh, you know, off the shelf products and platforms. Um, so I know that I'll always push back on those. You know, we can, we can do it better, we can make it more. Um, but you know, if I step back and look at the, the grand scheme of things, it's not worth it for a team to be making something like that every single time. Um, so yeah, I think it just goes back to understanding what the business context is and, and why they're being asked to do such a thing. I often find that particularly related to visuals. If you make an example of what you think might be a better solution and show them both and explain why you think this is a better representation of the data. What you ultimately find is somebody's requesting a pie chart because that's how it's been represented in every single paper they've seen. Where if you say, 
hey, there's a better way to do this. We can, we can get extra information if we plot this a different way. Let's do that, especially if it's for something important like an investor deck or, you know, if it's just for an internal R&D meeting, then share, have your, have your bar chart. I hate bar charts, um, but have your bar chart. But, you know, you could, you could add some dimensionality to the message that you're presenting with the data create it for them and show them side by side and explain why you think this is a better solution. And often you'll find that, you know, they're receptive to, to, to that. Let's go on to the next question. Uh, this is an interesting one. How would you explain data science to a grandparent? Heather, what, how about you start with this one? Um, I would just say we take, information from our products about how people use it and try to make that useful, useful to the business, useful to making better products. It's pretty, I think it's pretty clear cut. Helena, I'm interested in what you would say. Sure. So I would say that data scientist is the art of the art of asking computers to help us make better decisions. Oh, like that. Anyone else? I would probably say uh, we are attempting to uh, describe, you know, the real world as accurately as possible. Um, you, you know, you, the way that we think and the way that, you know, we see things, uh, we try and put that into a uh, kind of a, a computer form, into a mathematical form that we can, uh, you know, use in the future. I say often very loudly because my grandfather is 92 years old and can't hear. Um, <laughs> and I'm going to explain from a bioinformatics perspective, but I often, uh, and a specifically genetic, genetic related bioinformatics perspective, but I say I take lots of large scale genetic data and I use a computer to find the needle in the haystack is often how I try to explain it. Awesome. I'm glad no one said I find and replace unnecessary commas and log files. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> or a comma separated field in a CSV file. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. How about, uh, we were just talking about, uh, well, Adam off the shelf platforms and, you know, there's a lot of these plat platforms coming out um, claiming to do it all, build machine learning models for you, just press a button. Um, I think I know most of your thoughts on this, but you know, what, can you explain for the audience, maybe what are some of the dangers of, um, you know, going with these platforms versus building it in-house or at least not having the expertise while using these platforms? Adam, I know you have. Yeah. So for, for using platforms, you know, the dangers for me, I, you know, of course, it's the, you know, that you won't understand what's truly going on in the, on, you know, the back end of the platform. That's kind of the basic thing. Um, but I think that one thing that uh, I often overlook is, is how much it's going to take um, from a user to, to learn the platform. Um, you know, a lot of times we think that platforms will make our lives a whole lot easier. Um, but in reality, once you get it in, you know, once you get it and you start playing with it, it still takes a large amount of time to learn the intricacies, to learn what it's going to take to, to utilize in the fashion that you thought. And oftentimes it's, hey, you know, we got something out, but now we have to turn it into a process. Now we have to keep it running. It's, there's a whole lot more things downstream that still need to be done. Um, so I think that uh, kind of idolizing the tools and thinking that they're going to make your lives um, exponentially easier is usually something that uh, is a danger to myself and I think to a lot of uh, teams. And often it's more work to make. I mean, I feel like in, in this field, almost every company has a, a unique question and needs a unique solution to answer that question. So purchasing a platform, it's often more work to make that platform fit what you need it to do than to just build your own. And so, um, you know, it can be dangerous to adopt a platform. And if you're missing some key feature about the way it works or an assumption the platform is making, then you may be generating a bunch of irrelevant 
information to that you're using in, internally. And so I do think that it can be a little bit dangerous. Yeah, I, I heard there times where, sorry, go ahead, Lena. I, I heard a very funny expression the other day. Somebody said, the only thing that can be consumed out of a box is a pizza. Everything else needs to be configured and fine-tuned to your particular workflow or your particular problem. And I think that's, that's exactly the problem with existing platforms. We can't assume they can be consumed out of the box. Right. I mean, even with, you know, an R package or, or Python, you have to really understand what's happening under the hood. I, I like to say with great power comes great responsibility. Um, all right, here's a here's just one for I think most of you. Um, so a lot of you have made the transition from academia to industry, or you've gone to grad school or hold a PhD, or if you're like me, you've just worked in highly academic companies. And um, I'd like to know what are some of the stark differences between the two, between academia and industry. Like what maybe blew your mind when you first get into industry, and how do we you know better unite the two or bring the best of both worlds together? I can think of so many. Oh, go ahead. Go on, Heather. Sorry. I already spoke too much. It's your turn. So many things off the top of my head. Um, in terms of some differences, I'll think of, you know, just one, in academia, you can pursue an extremely interesting um, scientific question for a long period of time, and you have the flexibility to explore um, novel methods for approaching that question for the purpose of developing novel methods to do something. Um, in industry, our focus really is on what is the application, the impact, um, how we can move the needle on the business. And so we are not always thinking about how sophisticated our, um, our answer might be. If anything, it's the opposite. We want to be very careful not to over-engineer something if a very simple solution can get us most of the way there, like counting something versus building a really fancy model, then maybe that's what is the right thing for the business. Um, so... That is um, one of the things I can think of off the top of my head. So I would say there are a lot of uh, amazing discoveries happening in academia that I would, I hope we can, um, I want to see the two worlds better collaborating so that we can embed more of these uh, discoveries into um, industry applications. Um, that, that's something that I'm very passionate about and uh, always looking for more opportunities to, to do so. For me, I think that's also the biggest difference. I think that in, in academia, a lot of time is spent on perfection. And in industry, we're pushing toward a product and we really don't have time to let better get in the way of good enough sometimes. And so I think that the speed with which things come at you and, and the pace with which you're expected to work in industry is much higher. And so you need to have more of a big picture mindset often on things. Um, whereas in academia, you are afforded the opportunity to uh, really focus and go very in-depth sometimes into weeds you never thought existed on a problem that can be very interesting and is, a, is very important uh, for the progress of science. And so I think, you know, the collaboration between the two is perfect. We, we've got some work to do to figure out how to make it more streamlined, but um, I think both have a very important role in, um, you know, developing solutions for society. Yeah, one of the biggest, to, to piggyback off what uh, Lauren and Heather have said, one of the biggest differences, you know, from academia to um, industry for me is academia was always very much, um, you kind of figure out the problem that you want to go after, whereas, you know, the industry, the, you know, the biggest difference, and it's honestly, I think it's one of the bigger things that people fear when going to industry, that you will be controlled over kind of what problem you're given. Um, sometimes that's the case, but a lot of times it's actually, um, you know, this is the subject that you're going to be worried about. Try and, you know, make this the best that you can within, you know, within reason, you know, uh, you know, the best that you can in the given time frame and the resources that you have. Um, so I think that, you know, the fear is that you're going to lose autonomy, where it's not really that you're losing any autonomy. You're just, um, 
you're losing the, the chance to go down those routes that you would have otherwise in academia and you wouldn't have had a, an issue with. And Helena, you've had a pretty interesting path too because you're now with a consulting firm, but I've had a really, what are your thoughts? So to me, the key difference is, is, is in the horizon of applicability. So, so when you're in academia, the expectation is that you work on problems that have, you know, long-term ap applicability. So, you know, there's no expectations that the product you've built or the problem you've solved has to be applied immediately, right? Uh, sometimes, you know, there isn't even an expectation that the problem you're working on has to be applied at all in the real world, right? And, and, and in industry, you know, not only do you have a very short horizon impact for, for, your, for the applicability of your products, but it's, uh, uh, you have to have it. You know, the, the option of, of working on something that has no applicability in the real world does not exist. Right. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, it sounds like it's definitely, um, there's definitely this time factor in moving towards a, a product and trying to bring that same rigor to, you know, driving towards the solution. Uh, and it's an art probably and a balance that you've all had to learn how to, how to handle. Um, okay. Let's see if we can get some people riled up in the audience. We've had a, only had a couple questions. We'll get to another one of these in a bit. Uh, what are some misconceptions about the data science function from people on the IT side? So, you know, kind of like your data scientists, your IT admins, your uh, DBAs, and then people on the business side. And we're talking about people that are completely on the business side and completely on the, the tech side. And we know that sometimes they can go like this. So what, what are the misconceptions and how do we kind of bridge that gap? Um, I would say that one of the biggest misconceptions is um, that IT people don't know what's going on in the business. Um, oftentimes, um, they know more that's going on in the business than they lead on. You know, they're, they're responsible for looking at, you know, like you said, the database administration or the data flows and things like that. A lot of people think, you know, you're just responsible. You know, you're just the plumber of our data. When in reality, you know, they can probably tell you a lot more about the business because they're the ones who are actually looking at the data coming through and things like that. So I think that a lot of times it's their, uh, their thoughts are discounted um, and it's a little bit, you know, go back into your closet and make sure that everything works. <laughs> um, so I think that that's probably one of the biggest misconceptions is that uh, they don't know anything about business. And I think it also goes the other way too. Um, you know, a lot of people when they talk to you know, VPs or something, they say, oh, you know, you don't know what we're doing. When in reality, a lot of those VPs and things, you know, have come up, you know, at one point or the other, you know, probably was an analyst or a coder or something like that. So they do kind of understand. So I think that uh, a lot of times people forget that, you know, they both know a fair amount about, about what the other person is doing. Anyone else? I think that the biggest misconception I found from the IT side is sometimes the assumption that a pivot table is data science. It's not, right? Data science is about building the story. Right, so it's, it's a lot more, right, so you're saying it's less about the, the tiny bits and the day-to-day -day and the, it's, it's really, there's that art to it of building that narrative and the story, the story that most likely VPs and business leadership are going, are going to sell. Right. Exactly, exactly. You know, back, back to the grandparent answer, data science is really about using computers to support decision making. And, and many times our stakeholders are the strategy leads of the company who need to make decisions that will, you know, help the company grow or survive for the next five to 10 years. So it, it is partially our responsibility as data scientists to, to, to put together that narrative that will help them make the, the best decision possible. I feel like one of the misconceptions about data science or computational teams from the business side of things is that, is that we are not IT. I am not at all capable or qualified to help 
people with their computers. <laughs> so <laughs> I think that's one misconception that I run into quite often, especially at small startups where IT is still outsourced and has not been brought in house. Is you know people coming up going like, my computer crashed. What do I do? <laughs> what were you doing? I I don't know. <laughs> so um, I think that's one misconception that is kind of more on the lighter side, but that we are in IT. And then from an IT perspective, sometimes the IT departments can want to put heavy, heavy restrictions on what you are allowed to install and not install on your computers. And in the data science world, when we're often using or evaluating off the shelf tools or, you know, programs that we need to install on the fly to figure something out, we, we need to have admin privileges to our computers and they need to be generally higher powered than almost anybody else's at the company. And so one of the misconceptions about particularly restrictive ITT departments, I think would just be that we need a little bit more freedom uh, with our with our working tools, which is our computer. Mostly a misconception that I've seen from the business side is that uh, we data science can be extremely powerful at helping to shape and craft that story, as Helena said, like, that's our, that's our, what I see as our job and the greatest value that we can bring. And so we need to be involved at the early stages of discussions around problem solving and not give in a, uh, the, like the specific roadmap to a solution that is needed. We need to be involved in um, crafting that story that we have a lot more um, business expertise to bring to the table. Um, on the other side, it's not necessarily a misconception from IT, but I'll say something I've struggled with in the past is a misconception from uh, DE and the more technical side around what are the boundaries of data science expertise. As I mentioned at the beginning, that this function is very varied. I think some data scientists might skew more towards the technical side of things if they come from a computer science background or an engineering background and others might skew more towards the um, storytelling side of the business. Um, and I'd say I, I live more on the less technical side. And so from personal experience, exactly, I'll work with a data engineer to um, bring them in to understand what problem we're trying to solve and can support requirements definition, but I am not going to be an effective partner in ideating around a technical solution. And that's where I really rely on that collaboration and partnership. And I've had to work to bring them into a little more closely, where is the boundary of my expertise and being very explicit that um, it's, I, I am limited on the technical side, which is why we really need to um, partner on solutioning. Yeah, I think that's, these are all really good points. And, and this is going to lead me into another question. So having, being involved at the beginning in the ideation of a problem is highly important because you all understand how the data should be collected. That's probably most important, especially when you're looking at experimental designs and how to properly answer that question. The data will need to support whatever question the business is trying to solve. So getting the data team in there early is crucial. Uh, that said, what makes a good manager versus a bad manager? You, a lot of you have managed or been managed. Um, this is probably something to help the audience that is managing data scientists. Good qualities and bad qualities. That's a tough one. <laughs> I mean, it, in my point of view, and I, I wouldn't say everybody shares this, but there currently there is a huge pressure on data scientists right because there's so much visibility there's so much hype sometimes we need to protect the team from that um from that pressure we need to let the team focus on the specific problems we've asked them to focus on instead of throwing too much at them at the same time um, but that has consequences for the manager of course <laughs> one of them is you know we are forced to say no uh, very often and you know not a lot of company leads like that answer <laughs> so it's a, it's a difficult balance I think a good quality in a manager is uh, giving autonomy to a person doing something uh, giving them a little bit of freedom to try to do it their own way instead of being very prescriptive up front here's your problem here's how you're gonna solve it here's your problem 
you tell me how you're going to solve it, and then I'll tell you if you're real wrong. Um, but um, giving giving people the freedom so so the job maintains interest. I think we've discussed a little bit that it isn't all fun and games. There's a lot of a lot of data wrangling, a lot of uh, correcting mistakes and data formats. And so once we get that part done, we want to have the freedom to, to explore the fun part of the job. And so I think a really good quality data manager is providing folks with that autonomy and allowing them to kind of think for themselves about the solutions um, and supporting them in those solutions, backing them up when they present those solutions to the broader team. Um, and so I think that's both kind of touches on good and bad qualities. If you do that, it's good quality. If you don't, then it's probably not a great quality in the manager. Yeah, I think a good manager supports ruthless prioritization of what a data scientist is working on to protect them, protect their time. Um, and so they can really guide that, the prioritization side of things. But then once uh, somebody has a, a project um, to follow on the point that was just mentioned, I think really giving someone the flexibility space and autonomy to um, own that project on their own. Data science is really an art and a science. And so one needs the space to be creative um, in solutioning. And so um, that, real, that time and that autonomy really needs to be protected within the framework of uh, the fact that they're, what they're working on is the most important thing. Yeah, for me, someone, you know, a good manager is someone who, I'll say, protects the team or the data scientists. You know, we've talked a lot about, you know, how you're, how the team is managed, how it's managed up. So uh, a good manager is someone who doesn't kind of put their data scientists out to dry if, you know, if they're expected to present to, you know, a high level business partner or is embarking on something for the first time. So provide that support that they can uh, lean on when they need. And, you know, when they need to be pushed to either, you know, make a better story or how can you present this in a better way? Someone who recognizes that and can kind of get the, get the point across that, you know, the, there might be a better way to do this or, you know, how would you improve? Um, and I think that, you know, a, a poor manager is someone who really just says, this is your project. You present it. It's up to you don't, you know, like, I'm not going to, you know, if you do something poorly, it, it, it's all on you. Um, I think that that can be really detrimental to especially someone who's in their junior portion of their career. Um, so I think that that can really uh, uh, hurt a team in the long run. Right. And I'm going to remember ruthless prioritization. I like that. <laughs> uh, and that, that kind of brings me to, I mean, there's actually an audience question about this, so junior members, uh, and this is a popular one that a lot of you probably get all the time, so you probably have a canned answer at this point. Um, how do we start a career towards data scientists as a beginner? What's your recommendation to prepare for that role? Kaggle would be my, it's my default answer. Go to Kaggle, download some data sets, enter a competition. If you can find some meetups, virtual meetups around your area, join them. There's so many very bright people who are Focusing on Kaggle competitions, you can learn so much from them. Definitely agree. Yeah, I would say talk to someone if you're already in a company, for instance, that has them there, and you're in that, and you're in, you know, business already. Go and talk to a data scientist. You know, data scientists love to talk about data scientists. Usually, you know, it's <laughs> we're usually seen as people who like to program, but we love to talk. You know, usually when you get us all together. Um, so you know, just you know, go talk. See if you can learn. See if you can, you know somehow get involved in a project or you know learn on the job like that's a very easy way that i think that a lot of people don't utilize as much as they probably could um you, you're not kind of on it you know you have to do it alone you know outside of work you can you can usually do it um uh where you already work yeah talk to people and work to understand the business problems that they're solving with data science. So I think a lot of the technical skills can be learned, in my opinion, almost more, more easily than a depth of expertise of how to apply those technical methods to, um, to business applications. And so that's something that I often look at when I'm hiring and I, um, I can find it harder to come by. And I'm usually more impressed by somebody who is really 
has the requisite technical skills, but then is really focused on understanding and asking, asking questions around the application and how the functions drives the business forward. In addition, if you don't know how to program, learning to program is an obvious first step. And to do that, the, which I, I had to do going from wet lab science into computational sciences, but for me, taking a class wasn't the solution. I needed to actually find a question that I was genuinely interested in answering and then force myself to do that with, to answer that question with Python. And that could be something after speaking with a data scientist within your current company that you could help them with on a project, or it could be your fantasy, mining your fantasy basketball league data. It could be whatever is genuinely interesting to you that you motivates you to learn uh, the programming skills you need to answer that question. Awesome. All great answers. Yeah, I definitely agree. Dive in. There's so many tutorials online now. Um, a lot of resources available and people available. And as Adam said, data scientists like to talk. Um, I have another canned question, uh, last one, and then I'm going to give the audience more of a chance. And I also want you all to think about any comments or things that you'd like the audience to know before we wrap up, because speaking of conversations, you two can even ask each other questions. But first, uh, we're talking about good managers, bad managers. Uh, what makes a good vendor versus a bad vendor? I know we've kind of not been fans of off the shelf platforms, but you know, sometimes there's staff augmentation, sometimes there's solution. I, I'm sure that you've all had to work with vendors uh, and the vendors in the audience would probably love to hear this. Uh, so what's a good one, what's a bad one? Just one quality. For me, uh, I'll say a vendor is good if I ask them, what can you not do? And they answer me honestly. Um, and they say, we are not here to do X, Y, and Z. Um, if, if, if they come in and they try and sell me the world, um, I know it's probably not a vendor I want to work with. Great. Yeah, I think modularity is very important to me. Don't don't prepackage the problems you think I have, right? Help help me augment the tools that I have. This is to me what what makes a good vendor. Somebody who can, you know, not necessarily build me a black a, a, a black box, but somebody who can help me augment whatever capabilities I already have. I have to be responsive it's speaking to the pace of industry um, you want to negotiate a contract quickly but get the platform move set it up move forward and you want someone who's responsive when problems arrive so that you can really quickly get past them and you don't you don't want to spend days or longer um, waiting for a response also creating a product that allows for customization to fit people's unique solutions, um, I think is also really important. Don't lock down all your API endpoints. If we need to create another one, then let's let us do it. Um, and so I think that speaks a little bit to modularity, um, but be, be willing to improve the product based off of needs of, of, your, um, of, of the people using them. Great, it's all really interesting answers. And um, so so before we ask the last question, we could probably go at least till 10, unless the audience starts uh, asking more. Um, where do you see data science in say 10 years? And it's, a, it's one of those um, you know, broad questions, but it's always interesting. So where do you see it in 10 years? Is it like, is it like the next big data where it's hype? Uh, you know, we're seeing AI now, we're seeing all this block, blockchain and hype around um, just everything from uh, the new tools coming out left and right. Uh, where do you see it in, in 10 years? And does it just become part of our workflow kind of like when email first came out? I think data science has a danger associated with it. I mean, this is, we've seen, you know, what happened when Facebook unleashed their, their knowledge graphs and their connectivity graphs. People started abusing that, right? And, and there's no, there were no rules or regulation around it to prevent that data from me being misused and being abused. And I think there's a potential for that with every data set, right? Data science could be used for helping humanity or can be used to, you know, 
increase profits or to for you know not so altruistic reasons. Um, so it, depending on how well our regulators understand what can be done with data science, right? I think we could either be looking at the 10 year future where a lot more decisions are driven by data, or you know, we could be seeing data science fall into the, <laughs> you know, fall, fall starting to be used for purposes that are not necessarily helpful for humanity. I'll speak to where I hope data science will be. I hope we will um, be as equally and more effective at driving decision making, but that there will be more um, uh, transparency and uh, thought around data governance and user privacy and the implications of how we're using data. I think right now we're very much in the Wild West um, and it's hard even to predict the different ways in which um, her methods will be applied in the future, but I hope that we start getting more ahead of some of that forward thinking implications of what we're doing. So that, that's where I hope we are, that we're still driving forward the positive use cases, but that um, we're more in thoughtful about what we're, we're doing and that there's greater transparency. I hope that the boom of data science right now encourages uh, young people to become interested and um, invest time in their education and learning more about data science. So we get the next wave and, and we continue to uh, we continue to be able to recruit young, smart, talented folks to uh, to to join our cause so that we can continue to make progress um, in you know, helping humanity. Yeah, I would say where I hope it is, I think that today there's, there's two camps, you know, those who really trust data and those who don't. And I, and I hope that it gets to the point where it's not one or the other, you know, in 10 years, it's much more of they work in concert with each other and that, you know, there, there is an in-between type of place where, you know, you can have you know, data supporting, you know, real world evidence type of things and, you know, gut feelings are good for certain things. Um, so I'm hoping that we get to a place where it's not one or the other, but it's much more in concert with, uh, with both. Great. And go ahead, Lauren, were you going to say something? Oh, um, so I think that's, I mean, these are, these are great. Uh, I, one thing that I wanted to just mention is um, as we're coming to a close here is we there's this is an amazing panel uh, we we didn't touch on so many things I feel like we could probably keep going for um, I think we may even have 10 minutes but are there any you know we didn't talk about ethics and data science or data privacy um, biasing and data uh, that said is there any are there any last comments or anything you'd want you know rising or these young data scientists to know but also you know, what should VPs know at, at these companies right now? Um, just kind of like your closing thoughts, something, get, get your, get your, your uh, beliefs out there now for people to hear. So that's a very good point, Tanya, the, 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 the bias in data science. And I think the message I would give is don't try to avoid bias, right? It, that's an utopia. Data will always be biased. Just understand the bias in your data and make sure that you're very clear in articulating what your data science product is can be used for. Right, and, and data will always be biased and that's because it's man-made, right? Yeah. I think on the ethical front, um, honesty is always really important and it's it's more important to tell people the truth than it is to tell people what you think they want to hear particularly when it comes to data analysis so a bad result is equally as important as the result people were expecting or wanted to see both help progress toward the end goal and so i think just maintaining your honesty and not being afraid to give the bad news uh as you know, as an equal excitement to being able to give the good news. 
Yeah, to piggyback off Lauren, you'll get a lot more trust in the industry and get a lot further if you're known as someone who can uh, who can just tell it like it is, even if it's the the not the thing that people want to hear. Um, I think that a lot of people usually think, you know, I'll make sure that you know whatever question is asked, what what the person is hoping to hear, I'll uh, I'll, I'll make sure that that happens. When in reality, it's the opposite. If you can tell them truthfully it's not possible or it's not something that we should do that is worth uh more in weight than doing what someone wants usually yep i think we're seeing a lot of that lately um good to know what you don't know heather um to i'll say just follow on what everyone else said being really clear with expectations around limitations you're making assumptions you're making timelines required to achieve something because it's not just the analysis, but it's also the pipeline work and governance and um, other cross-functional uh, requirements for what you're aiming to do. So just being really clear um, often uh, about managing expectations up and down is super important. Excellent. And um, I think we're about ready for a coffee break, uh, but one, I think the audience uh, is finally caffeinated a bit. We have one more question. I think I was told we can go till 10.10. So uh, have you ever had to tell a client that your question cannot be answered with the data you have or that they are asking the wrong question? All the time. <laughs> um, that's, that's a daily occurrence. Um, you know, you get a random email from someone or someone comes to you and saying, this is what we love to do. Uh, and you know, when you've been doing this for a while, you can quickly reply with not possible. Here are the reasons why. Um, that is a that is a normal occurrence that you that you learn to do uh, weekly at least. Yeah, I, I try to push that a little bit further and say this is the data you need <laughs> to answer this question. <laughs> yes, definitely. Lauren? Yeah, same. Here's what you have. Here's what you need to answer that question. But here's what we can answer with what you have. <laughs> yep, and here are the limitations. Yeah, and what are your what are your goals? Help me understand like what specifically is the problem? Maybe we can't do that, but maybe we can. Let, let's understand how else we can help you drive towards whatever goals you're driving towards. Great. All right. Well, I want to thank our panelists so much. Um, this was awesome. Uh, I think we answered just a lot of cool questions. And um, if you have questions for our panelists, they're most you could find most of them online, or they're available. Um, and this will be recorded, so if you missed anything, um, you'll be able to to rewatch it. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, everyone. Uh, please join us for a coffee break in our virtual exhibit hall. And then we will come back here. I've already shared the link to our next talk at 1020. I'll see you then. Thank you. Right. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.